Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Long Box Carpentry. I am Noel, and joining me again is J.D. DeMott. I am J.D., and definitely not an alien simulacrum. Are you sure? Well, if I was, would I know? Okay, I want you to set up a webcam, draw some <laughs> blood, and I'm, I'm trusting you here. This is on the trust system. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get into the blood test, I think, as we discuss this. Oh, boy. I hope you love the blood test, because we're going to have that almost every single issue that we're discussing here. Yeah, and this is our second episode on comics spinning off of John Carpenter's The Thing, or as they've retitled it at Dark Horse, The Thing from Another World, going back to the old 51 film. We've got three stories to cover on this one. Three very different stories. Yeah. Run the gamut. Two very much the same, but yeah. This one's going to be a little interesting to discuss, especially one of them. One in particular, yeah. Anything you want to add before we start jumping into the comics? No, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Why don't you just give us one more plug where people can find you online? You can find me on YouTube at YouTube slash JD DeMott, or you just type in Comics Are Awesome, or from the pages, I do comic book and comic book related movie reviews. Or you can find me at Twitter at J.D. Demott. That's J-D-D-E-M-O-T-T-E. Yeah, and we're still going with uh, Longbox Carpenter here, but man, we're still stuck in the thing. Uh, yeah. Well, there could be worse places we could be stuck on, I'm sure. Worse tentacles we could be wrapped in. I don't know if this is the highlight or the low point. I mean, The Thing's one of my favorite movies, but reading through these, i kind of wondering, is there a whole lot to say after you get past that film? We'll get into it as we go along, but at least two of these stories feel very similar. Yeah. I should ask, have you listened to the episode I did on Return of the Thing? Yes. And I did actually was intrigued by that. That one actually was something I really wish they had made. Yeah. And it's been interesting, like, diving into the research of that between when we recorded our first episode and recording this episode, because now I'm seeing a lot of little stray threads of that in things, especially Eternal Vows, though just not as well. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into we'll Eternal get into Vows. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> Eternal oh. Vows. Yeah. So before we get to Eternal Vows, we are going to start with The Thing from Another World Questionable Research, which was a backup story. I want to say they're each like six, seven pages long chapters, which was serialized in the anthology Dark Horse Comics, not to be confused with Dark Horse Presents by Dark Horse Comics. Dark Horse Presents Dark Horse Presents <laughs> Dark Horse Comics Presents Dark Horse Comics. A Dark Horse summer special. <laughs> so this ran in issues 13 to 16 from September of 1993 to December of 1993, which I believe overlapped with when Climate of Fear, the second of the Thing miniseries, which we covered in the last episode, ran. I was wondering, because this doesn't seem to tie in with the... Uh... No, it's kind of like a side story. It seems like a side story, but you could peg it as being after the first mini that we discussed, or in between the first and second ones. Yeah, the sense that I get, and we'll get into this story in a minute but since i get it, is like mccrady went one direction and then this story went another direction right it's kind of like a little brief side epilogue quest thing interlude mm -hmm. it's written by edward martin the third with pencils by ted naife colors by ray murtog and inks on the first two chapters by moose bomb and on the remaining two by alex nino do any of those names jump out at you as someone you recognize? No, I'm afraid not. I know a couple of them, and I'll get into them. Edward Martin III is someone who I had never heard of before. He was mostly an editor at Dark Horse throughout the 90s, and this is one of just a handful of stories he wrote, mostly in anthology books. He also did an alien story, a brief series called Star Riders, and a handful of shorts and Negative Burn. Since 2001, though, he's actually become a very prominent figure in the H.P. Lovecraft fandom community in that he's written and directed a number of short films, mostly animated for the various H.P. Lovecraft film festivals, and is mostly known for doing a full-length feature animated adaptation of The Dream Quest of Unknown Cutoff which I haven't watched yet, but I'm currently reading the original novella it's adapted from, and I'm very curious to see what he did with it. Interesting. And you might enjoy it as a co-host of Return to the Dreaming, the same and reread podcast. Dream Quest of Unknown Cows is part of the Randolph Carter series of stories that Lovecraft did, 
which are his dream stories, which were very influential on Neil Gaiman. Oh, that does sound interesting. I may have to check that out at some point. Now, Ted Naifa is an artist that I have actually read some of his work, and it's very surprising to see him here. He got his start at Innovation Comics in 1991 with a special for their Sentry character and an adaptation of Gene Wolfe's The Shadow of the Torturer. After this Thing story and starting up Dark Horse's original character, The Machine, he sporadically contributed to a number of anthology books before launching into various creator-owned projects starting in the 90s and going to today, like Nick Shadow, Gloom Cookie, Courtney Crumrin, which I've read and is very good, The Gun Witch, Death Jr., Polly and the Pirates, also very good, Unearthly, and The Good Neighbors, and one-off stories for Star Wars, The Nocturnals, and X-Men, and has also painted numerous cards for Magic the Gathering. Hmm. Seriously, I highly recommend Courtney Crumrin and Polly and the Pirates, because he has this style that's very much like Powerpuff Girls, or Samurai Jack, or, or even Osama Tezuka. Oh, really? Because I would not have gotten that based on the style that he uses here. Yeah, it's surprising to see his style here, and we'll get into that, because I'm not used to seeing him do, like, realistic characters. Yeah. Which admittedly, I mean, I think it would have been hard to convey the horror if you're doing super stylized cartoony characters, but I think the art here is probably the best part of it. The story. Um, we'll get to it. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into the story later, but I, I will say the art, it's not like the best art I've seen in the world, and I think it starts off stronger than it gets a little weaker as it goes along, to be honest. Well, it changes inkers. Yeah, and I can kind of tell. Yeah, and I should point out, his style is, if you've ever read the series of Unfortunate Events books, his style of storytelling is very similar to those type of books. Hmm. Very twisted, little, dark, fun, tongue-in-cheek parables, which again is very weird to see him in this book. That's interesting. I would like to see some more of his stylized stuff. Yeah, I do recommend it. And uh, Moose Bauman got his start as a colorist at Eternity in Malibu in the early 90s, and while this is one of his rare works as an inker, he hasn't really done that many, he's been a pretty steady and prominent colorist at DC since 1998 and currently works on most of the relaunch titles at Valiant. And Alex Nino began creating indie comics in the Philippines way back in the mid-60s. And he was part of the big Bronze Age wave of artists when him and a whole group of Filipino artists were brought to the United States by Joe Orlando to work at DC. Hmm. And he first made a name for himself on their 70s horror line, including Weird War Tales and The Witching Hour. And after co-creating Captain Fear and doing some work for Marvel on their epic line, he jumped over to doing one-off stories for Warren and Heavy Metal. And his work has always been a little sporadic in terms of actual comics and storytelling, and he primarily focused on pinups and covers and commissions at conventions, though he did also do work as a concept artist for Disney's Atlantis. Hmm. And he's officially retired these days because he was born in 1940s. So he's been in the industry for quite some time. Yeah. But he still draws commissions on the con circuit. You can still find him at a lot of cons around town. That's really cool. So that's all I have for the creators. Do we want to just kind of give like a brief summary of what this comic is about? It's the thing on a boat. It's the thing on a boat. Yeah, it's basically the thing comics that we covered in the last episode picked up with McCready and Childs as they strayed away from the camp, went off, submarine, whaling ship, Brazilian rainforest. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like a separate group of Americans came to investigate the camp. All they found were the remains of one of the things, which is probably the one that McCready failed to torch in the first miniseries, because I know he tried to and he was stopped. Right. And they bring that with them onto a boat. And of course, while they're investigating it and discussing it, a part of it breaks off, starts to spread, and again, gradually takes over all of the crew until one lone survivor is left stranded on an iceberg and he looks in the eyes of a seagull, realizes it's a thing as it takes off into the air. Yeah. And it's a very short story. It's six, seven pages serialized over the course of four issues, so it's like 30-some pages in length. Yeah. Do you recommend it or not? No. It's basically a retread of the movie, but I don't like any of the characters. Um, mm. Especially the head scientist character who spends like half of one of the very short issues that they have denouncing morality, saying, oh, morality <laughs> isn't a thing for scientists. Scientists don't believe in morality. We can can just do whatever the fuck we want to. It's one of those science fiction stories. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I'm not even like a sciencey guy, and I know that's not true. And he was just so despicable. And then the rest of them do not get fleshed out at all for the most part. Yeah. There's the one who's like, this is bad. We shouldn't be doing this. And then that's about the only personality trait he has. And you have woman pilot. Yeah. Captain who's her husband. Yeah. Then there's just other scientist, other staff guy. I had a hard time telling who was who. Yeah. 
I like the art, but I do think there was a few times where I'm like, the one guy who's the guy who thinks that this is a bad idea, I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman because of the haircut. In a few panels, it looked like a woman with a very short cut, or the way that the features were drawn, it just looks kind of feminine at certain points. But in general, I just, none of the characters really spoke to me. And so then when you get into this basically retread of the plot from the film, I mean, it was a neat idea. Like, okay, we're going to examine the thing and look at it from a scientific perspective and perform basically vivisections on it as we unfreeze little bits of it and then infect like a rabbit or whatever. But then it doesn't go anywhere with that. Yeah. It doesn't, because I imagine that the writer probably didn't either have the time or space to write it, or it mm. didn't have anything interesting to add to the mythos, which we'll be getting into internal battles quite a bit. But as far as like, oh, well, if it's called questionable research and it's about scientists studying this thing. There's cool potential for like expanding out what we know about this organism and how it works and everything. And... It really doesn't. And so instead, it's just thing by numbers. And I agree with you. And again, I thought it started off fine in that I like the idea of as they're carrying in the frozen thing carcass, just one finger snaps off of it, Mm -hmm. sprouts legs and starts crawling around until it infects the rats, who then infects all the other animals in their cages, who then starts infecting the people. I like just that visual of just a little pinky finger suddenly becoming a life of its own and causing this entire chain reaction. But again, yeah, it sets up, we're going to actually examine the thing. We're actually going to look at it. They even specifically bring up Blair's research in the recordings left by McCready of like, we're going to build on that research and we're going to follow on what they started. And they don't. Now, the ending of this one where the douchebag scientist guy is floating on a log. Was that even the scientist guy or was that the captain of the ship? I don't I... <laughs> I think that's... I think douchebag scientist guy didn't have the beard, and maybe he did. I don't remember. Looking at it right now, hold on. I'm even looking through the comic right now, and from issue to issue, people have different looks. Yeah. I think the guy with the beard is the... He was the head scientist, yeah. Yeah. But he wasn't the morality argument. (laughs) Okay. It's hard to keep track, and whoever he is, that ending, that's pretty much taken from the original novella, right? I, More or less. The concept, well, in the original novella, there was a bit where a group of seagulls came and landed on a ridge by the base, and the heroes ran out and just started shooting at them to try and shoo them off, and the birds fly away, and they're just kind of left wondering, were they still birds when they went away? Otherwise, that's kind of the entirety of the scene. But this one is, yeah, he's sitting there floating in the ocean on a piece of wreckage. There's a bird there and he looks the bird in the eye, realizes it's a thing as it flies off. Or do we know that it's a thing? Because I'm looking at the page. I don't know because you just have that red and black eye. Yeah, but we never see the eye beforehand. So if it's supposed to indicate that something changed. It could just be that he's realizing the possibility. Right. It's not clear. And which is admittedly kind of a nice, like I said, that's why I thought it might be an homage to the universe. Novella. I do think it's an echo to the story, but mm-hmm. it is in a different way. But no, I don't dislike it. It's actually a, a nice addition. I just wish the story had built to it better. It also feels like kind of a retread of the ending of the thing, where instead of McCready and Childs freezing together on in the Antarctic, you've got this guy basically doomed to die in the ocean horribly, and this bird that may or may not be a thing flying off. It's a nice little echo. and I mean, it's not great, but considering I really didn't care too much for this story, it's probably one of the parts I think actually works best. Just because, it, you know, yeah, this bird may or may not be a thing and it's now flying off and you don't know what will happen from there. And I also love bits like the one guy checking the ship who finds the room with the spaceship being built in it. And there's just a human who like pulls himself out from under it like they're coming out from under a car. And then they keep going and they just have like this giant centipede thing body. Mm -hmm. I love the way he draws things. Yeah. The creatures are all great. And there are some nice bits like that whole end bit where the final scientist and the woman on the helicopter... I don't know if they're the couple or not, because I don't know. I know she's married to someone and I don't remember who. And I'm even flipping through and I can't find out who. But it's that great moment of, is she a thing? He tests her blood. She's positive And he has to kill her. You know, I like that moment. I actually kind of like that they have that weird little injection tube thing that they test the blood in. It's a little different than having the hot wire, because we'll discuss the hot wire quite a bit in the next one. But yeah. uh, I, I'm just kind of tired of the blood test. It's one of those things that it was an iconic scene of the film. It's just that between all these comics that I've read... It's always so drawn out, the blood test. You have to get the samples and the Petri dishes, put everyone's name on it. Right. That's one of the things I liked about Return of the Thing. 
okay, it's beaten the blood test. Anyone we come across, let's just zap with a taser. And if they burst into it. Which, I mean, yeah, exactly. It's a neat idea for when you're trying to build up tension. When you're in a life or death situation, like the ship was basically, everybody on that ship was pretty much either dead or a thing by that point. And he has to take the time to like do a blood test on her. And it feels like if this was a film, that'd be a weird scene to have in a film. Yeah. I agree with you. And again, you know, that's something we brought up in the last one of like in any of these sequel or spinoff comics, if this had been made into a movie, would it have worked as a movie? Yeah. Questionable research doesn't even have that much story. No. I could see this as being like when they came out with The Ring 2. They did The Rings. The Rings. Yeah. And that was like a nice little like short story that was basically repeated the original but had its own little twist on it. And this is kind of the same thing. I actually really like Rings, yeah. Well, I liked Rings better than I liked Ring 2. From the director of Ninja Turtles. <laughs> That's awesome. Um this is basically that same thing. It tells a story that's kind of like the original and it has a little bit of a twist on it, but nothing that really would stand up for a full hour and a half to two hour film. Though, you know, that was always the weird thing about Rings. And not to go too much into that because we got to talk about things. <laughs> Rings had so much more story and evolved the story down different avenues in 15 minutes more than Ring 2 did in an hour and a half. Right. Which is always why it's kind of been a frustrating that it was paired with Ring 2. Yeah. And I wish this comic was like that. I really wish this was because I think the idea of we'll have scientists approach the thing, you know, as opposed to a bunch of they were kind of scientists in the Antarctic, but they weren't biologists that were clearly, you know, designed to study this thing in depth. I have an idea. Have you ever heard of the Plague Dogs? No, I don't think so. Oh, yeah. The Plague Dogs was a story by the same author who did Watership Down and had a film directed by the same director as Watership Down. Plague Dogs is a story done entirely from the point of view of dogs in an experiments lab where they're used to test, you know, surgical techniques, viruses, all that stuff. And it's done entirely from their point of view as, of course, things go wrong. They end up escaping from the lab or running through the countryside. What if you did this story from the point of view of the lab mice and rabbits? And like this whole story of the ship gradually succumbing to the infection is playing in the background as you get the microcosm of the community of the lab animals. That could be cool. I mean, especially for like a 30 page short. Right. I was going to say, like, it's something that would not make a good movie. No, but if you're going to do like a tight little short story. I agree. Yeah, that would be a way better than just repeating the original story, which is what they did here. Explore it from at least a different point of view. That would sound more interesting than what we got. So I definitely would much rather have read that story than this one. And not that I necessarily blame them. It's I don't think there was a lot of space here to tell a great addition to the Thing universe. And this is starting to run into things that we ran into in the first episode of... Dark Horse had the problem of just doing spinoffs that were kind of derivative of the original, sometimes to very good effect, sometimes to poor effect. And the thing as a concept has limitations to what you can actually do with it without just repeating everything over and over again. I agree. Do you have anything else you want to say about questionable research or should we move on to Eternal Vows? Let's move on to Eternal Vows. And speaking of adding new things to the canon, yeah, this one goes well above and beyond. Yeah. <laughs> Now, whether they're good or not... This was not at all what I expected it to be going in. <laughs> no, I did not know what to expect with this one. This was the one I was kind of the most curious about. Yeah, well, let's get into the who made it here first okay. real quick. Thing from Another World Eternal Vows was, again, another four-issue miniseries, which was published from December 1993 to March 1994. While the first two series were collected in a trade paperback, this one has never been collected, as far as I've been able to tell. And it was written by Dave DeVries with pencils by Paul Gulacki. I don't know if it's Paul Gulacki or Paul Gulacki. Inks by Dan Davis and colors by Steve Matson for issue one and Matt Hollingsworth for the remainder of the series. Now, do any of those names jump out to you? Davis is familiar to me. I believe he did Sandman Mystery Theater. I think he did some of it. He, he's done a lot of work at DC where he'll come in and just do fill-in issues as an inker mm -hmm. whenever they're behind on stuff. Most of his longer runs have been on like Guy Gardner and Scooby-Doo and Young Justice and also some runs on Animaniacs and Archie. Or maybe I'm mixing it up with somebody else. Well, Dan Davis is kind of one of those names, so. Yeah, but no, the rest of them I'm not terribly familiar with. Well, Dave DeVries, who is not to be confused with artist David DeVries, even though Dave DeVries also then became an artist. So it's very confusing. <laughs> 
He was actually born in New Zealand, which explains a lot about this story. Okay. He got his start in the 80s, penning strips for Fantastique and Mad Magazine and Penthouse, before co-founding the Australian comic book anthology Cyclone Comics. He then moved to American comics in the 90s with fill-in issues of Grimjack and Suicide Squad. He was actually the guy who helped redo the origin of Captain Boomerang into kind of what it is nowadays. Mm. And he did a handful of odd issues here and there. Again, he would always step in for fill-in work. And he also did original miniseries like The Southern Squadron, Full Throttle, a pair of spinoffs for the Puppet Master film series, an elemental spinoff called Fathom, not to be confused with Michael Turner's Fathom. And then Marvel's brief incarnation of The Phantom when they owned it in the 90s. And then also did some brief runs on Magnus Robot Fighter, Black Lightning, and a Tigra strip in Marvel Comics Presents. He left comics in 1996, shifting to work as a commercial illustrator. And then in 2011, he wrote and directed his first feature film with the Australian indie thriller Carmilla Hyde and has a cameo in the upcoming Captain America Civil War as a custodian. Oh, wow. And then Paul Galacki was a pretty big cult name in the 70s and 80s. He got to start at Marvel on Morbius the Living Vampire, then rose into prominence with a long run on Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu. And he moved on with a number of titles before drawing Saber, one of the first graphic novels from Marvel's epic imprint way back in 1978. Wow. And he's continued on with Airboy, Batman, Catwoman, JSA, Jonah Hex, Conan, Tom Strong, and has also done licensed work on Predator, Terminator, James Bond, Star Wars, and original minis like, I know Link Carl does this one, Psy Spy, <laughs> Splash Maraud, True Believers, and Six from Sirius. So, interesting body of work between these characters. Yeah. So, the story for The Thing Eternal Vows. God, this one's going to be interesting. Yeah, this one's all over the map, isn't it? Kind of following up from the first Thing miniseries, where the Thing was trapped on the submarine that crashed in the bottom of the ocean. It then infected a passing fish, which was then caught by fishermen, which then led to this small island off the coast of New Zealand, where basically everyone hates the mainlanders, including the lead police chief, who's a mainlander. The thing ultimately, in the form of this little fish, starts to become ingested by pets and people on the island and starts gradually taking them over as... Was it in questionable research that they came up with the idea that the thing infects the brain last? Or was it in this one? I don't know if they spell that out in questionable research or not, but it's definitely a huge part of this storyline. So yeah, it then starts taking over, and then we get a woman who is dating a sailor on a ship who then becomes infected, and the two of them, as infected things, start bringing on a whole new perspective to what the actual thing organism is. I'll I'll save getting into that into the conversation, but needless to say, they start killing people on the islands, the murders start catching attention, and McCready comes to the island with a brand new custom state-of-the-art flamethrower, which of course he loses within an issue. (laughs) And it becomes this big fight as the island gets isolated everyone starts turning into things and there's a big fight on a fishing boat and a lot of panties and negligees and (laughs) yeah so is this one that you would recommend Uh, this one challenged me a lot more than the the last one i will give it that it's definitely outside the box (laughs) i can't say i can recommend it If you're just a fan of the thing, this one is probably not going to offer you a whole lot more thing goodness. Probably going to piss you off more than (laughs) But I will say it does have a few interesting ideas that I think might be worth a look if you're open to things that don't feel like they're part of the thing universe, but might have an interesting take on what it might be like. In an alternate thing universe, this might be a decent follow-up. I definitely agree with that, where it's unconventional. It definitely made me pause and think think about it. And I do give it credit for trying to do something outside the box and trying to take the thing in a different direction. Mm -hmm. I don't think it does the best job of it. And my big problem with it is in terms of both writing and art, it is remarkably consistently inconsistent (laughs) in that it'll do like some really well put together stuff followed by some really sloppily put together stuff. There are some images that are really well-crafted and striking and sharp right next to some images that look rushed and sloppy. I think it was like issue three where the artist draws McCready and he (laughs) doesn't look a thing like... I honestly thought, wait a minute, when did Roddy Piper from (laughs) They Live come in? Because he's got the jacket and the long hair. I'm here to chew bubblegum and test some blood. (laughs) Yeah, he... (laughs) 
It, I mean, he's got the sunglasses on with the flamethrower. It looks like Roddy Piper. It does. I had to go back and look at the previous issue when he first shows up, and I'm like, he doesn't look like that there. He doesn't quite look like Kurt Russell, but he doesn't look like Roddy Piper either. It, yeah, the inconsistency. I, for a while, that could have sworn that there was a change in artist. Well, there was a change in anchors between issues one and the yeah. remainder, but yeah. This penciler, his art, from panel to panel, it can look different. Right. Like, the main cop character, he is... Most of the issue, he looks like a well-groomed John Constantine from Hellblazer. Yeah, with glasses. And then there's another issue where he looks like a frumpy-looking... Like, his head's a completely different shape, and I almost thought, like, wait, is that supposed to be the same character? (laughs) It's really inconsistent. Yeah, And then there's the character of Jenny. Yeah. Let's just focus on how she's drawn here first. Then we're definitely going to get into her as a character. Super sexualized. (laughs) It's sexualized, but there's also this horrific air to it. There's a lot of times where she's like really coiled and flexed and veins are sticking out. But what's weird is you'll have panels where like in the same panel, she'll be posed in a way that is both sexy and terrifying. Mm -hmm. I think that might be intentional, but it's still just really odd. And how, yeah, she spends half this comic either naked or just in a negligee and panties. Mm -hmm. But again, even just talking about the sexualizing, her entire story is about sexualizing the thing and about how now that the thing is in a woman, it has this whole sexualized air to it of dealing with her bond with a man in her life yeah let's just say it's a vampire story it is and it's a weird one too that doesn't really fit the thing universe because she's infected by this guy named powell who she's having a relationship with as a std basically yeah and he turns her into a thing and it basically reveals that things have an advanced metabolism where It's not just about spreading, but it's about consuming. They need to keep eating fresh cells. And that if things don't continue having things to eat, having people or organisms to eat, then they'll be forced to turn on each other and start eating each other. Which is one of the things I really liked because it was a nice addition as to like, why would a creature evolve into this? Because it makes a certain amount of sense that the creatures would have a somewhat instinctive nature to limit their population growth, Mm -hmm. where the survival of the species comes first. But then after that, you don't want to create too much competition with yourself. So You don't want to drain your resources too much. So it's a clever way of being able to continue the story without having the entire world be threatened because it's no longer out in the Antarctic. It's actually out in a place where there's plenty of life. There's animals and plant life and all this other stuff that, in theory... That was one of the problems we had with... uh, The rainforest one? Yeah, the climate of fear, was that called? Yeah. That was where it didn't make sense that the world wasn't already entirely doomed. Yeah. And this is a way of making that make a little bit of sense. Of course, then they uh, ruin it because the Ginny character basically ignores the Powell thing's advice. We should say that what they're doing is they're going around and attacking victims and consuming their cells, but without passing on the thing infection to create new things. Right. So they're leaving a trail of bodies in their wake. And Powell is like, don't spread the infection or else you're going to have competing for what resources are. And I can't remember what exactly happens. Is it because she gets distracted in a moment and ends up passing it on to one of her friends whom she attacks? Well, I think she spreads it to the shop owner that... uh, Is it just because she doesn't want to kill her friend? I... I don't recall. I couldn't quite get the moment. I don't think they explain it well. But then it really goes to hell when McCready and the policeman are going after her and she creates another thing in order to create a distraction so that way she can get away. And I'm looking at the scene right now with her and the shop owner. And all it's saying is that, you know, she's in a conversation with her friend and her captains are, no, Jennifer, don't do it, as she does it, as she attacks her friend. So I'm thinking it's just that she pulled back and couldn't kill her friend, so she just infected her. Because what's weird is that also everyone who becomes a thing retains their personality as a person, even though they now have all these memories and everything on top of that. Which, if you're going to create something that infects the host, but it keeps the memories, that means that everything is going to be slightly unique. And I like the idea of things who break away from the status quo of what things usually do. Right. But the way it's done, though, is just... 
For one thing, they add a new power where they're able to take the healthy cells from their victims. While shedding their own dead cells. Right, which basically means that they can leave a body that looks like the body that they're currently inhabiting. Turn off trails and stuff, yeah. Right, and and it's a neat idea, but it's something that really kind of felt like it came out of nowhere because it's not something we've ever seen in any other, and probably would have been helpful, at least in the, the movie or something like that, possibly, to throw people off or whatever, but I don't know. I just, I just don't really see, like... The motivation, I think it doesn't really fit with the thing that we've seen. When again, it's all tied to her sexuality and her relationship with Powell. Right. Instead of like getting into any broader issues of what would it be like to be a society of things, you know, it never gets into that. Those are suggestions that are there, but it's all about her just wanting to be with Powell. Mm -hmm. It's a vampire story. (laughs) And it feels weird because the actual Powell takes the place of another sailor, Holt, and he dies in the jail cell. And that's like at the end of issue like two. What I think it is is because Powell infects her, there's always going to be a part of Powell that's inside of her. Right. And I get that. It's an interesting idea. I don't think it really fits the thing because it feels weird. And admittedly, part of it is that we've never had anything come from the thing's perspective. So we don't know how much of the previous host or multiple hosts as it's able to take on the genetic traits of anybody it's been in in the past affects it, affects that individual organism. Again, I I do appreciate this for trying to tackle that and for trying to bring some new ideas to the mix, but they just don't ultimately work in the end. I appreciate this as a one-off little EU thing, but as part of this broader thing series that they're building, it just does not fit. Like I said, the big problem for me is the fact that it seems to be built upon this love story. Which we never get to develop or explore, yeah. Yeah, the thing, the pal host ends up dying in the second issue, and there's no real resolution to that from the Jenny thing's perspective. Now, admittedly, like you said, he's still alive in her head because there is that part that is always going to be with her. And I get it, but there should have been a reaction to her realizing that the pal that we knew, that she knew, is gone. And like I said, this challenges me so much because there's things in there I can really see a good idea. I genuinely love, and I've been saying this through all the Thing podcasts I've been doing, I genuinely want more stories that explore the fact, because, you know, there's always this argument of, is the Thing even an intelligent organism or is it just kind of parroting and reacting? It's like, you cannot perfectly imitate an intelligent organism without yourself becoming an intelligent organism. Just the mere fact that it has spread to space-faring technology, to humans, to other things, yes, it is an intelligent organism. And yet every mind that it touches is going to be a unique mind. So I love this idea of dealing with consciousness, individuality. How does that tie together when you have multiple consciousnesses and individuals continually lumping on top of one another? You and I, before this podcast, were talking about Warren Ellis. Yeah. Boy, would he be perfect to explore stuff like this. Yeah, exactly. I, I would love to see Warren Ellis, or somebody of that caliber anyways, to tackle these issues. And I think that the writer might have been up for it if he had maybe a little bit more of a stronger editor to kind of keep yeah. it focused. I want more thing stories that explore this type of stuff. I just don't think this one pulled it off. Right. And again, a large part of it is it just becomes a typical vampire story of going the usual STD route of she's been infected, so she starts spreading it to other people and while always pining over the person who gave it to her. It's just your typical master vampire with servant vampire type of thing. And it's not bad, but it just doesn't work. (sighs) Yeah, and even, like, I was really surprised when McCready showed up, and I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting him. That's kind of cool. Except there's really nothing he does here. <laughs> so just run around with a flamethrower. Right, and it's something that you could have had the cop be able to figure out, hey, these things don't like fire, and you could have had pretty much the exact same story. There's no reason for McCready to be there other than just to drop exposition. Or, you know, what you could do. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely drop McCready. But, you know, what I like is you have that twist where she goes from killing people to start spreading things. As the things start to spread, Jenny starts to realize she's done the wrong thing. And she's the one who cuts off the island by burning all the boats and isolating it as she now wants to destroy the other things so that her and Powell alone can be there. 
that would be great if Powell didn't die and have it be that Powell is the one who is trying to get on that one last ship to escape so he can keep spreading the thing and thus you create a conflict between the two lovers of him who wants to go out and spread this now onto other people and her being like, but wait, this is the thing that's between us. Isn't it supposed to be us that are special? Yeah, and I do have to admit I have problems with the fact that basically the conflict seems to spread because they kind of are slut shaming her a bit because yeah. it's basically she cannot keep it in her pants she starts infecting all these people and that causes all these problems and otherwise things would have been okay does that mean that he practiced safe sex and that he just killed people instead of infecting them <laughs> i kind of think that yeah he said that as long as you just don't let any living cells enter their body because otherwise they'll be infected and that creates competition the handling of the character of jenny is horrible <laughs> From the art to the writing to everything, she is just a very flighty, reactionary, spilling into everything in a lot of, yes, STD, slut-shaming tropes. Mm -hmm. And again, the fact that the art does not miss an opportunity to have her pose suggestively in panties and negligee, even while she's transforming into a tentacled monster. Yeah. It's 90s. It's so 90s. It is. When did you say this came out? This was 93 to 94. Yeah, and that's right about that era. It's the image era. Admittedly, she's hypersexualized, but at least she's not the giant, you know... No, she had a realistic figure. And again, I like that the story isn't afraid to draw her ugly at times in terms of how she's often contorted and in kind of this animalistic rage at times. Right. But the fact is that they almost always do that right as she's like nearly naked. Oh, yeah. And there's plenty of times in this comic where she's just full on naked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And again, it does bring up the issue of falling into the trap of when you introduce the thing to a female character of sexualizing it. There are some degrees to which the prequel movie ran into this. I know that's one of the specific reasons why Carpenter didn't want women in his one was he didn't want sexuality to be part of it at all because he didn't want it to take a wrong direction or a wrong turn. And this is kind of an example of how you can go too far down that wrong path. And to a degree, I can see like how that might be native to a story that's so much about body horror. And I think that's the problem with storytellers, male storytellers who can't write about women without sexualizing them. Right. I don't think you'd have to do that, but I could see that it being an easy trap to fall into yeah. where it's like, oh, well, because she's infected now, she's going to seduce him to get him alone. And that means she's going to start taking off clothes and we get our gratuitous boob shot. And then, oh, there comes his tentacles and all the evil stuff happens. I'm kind of glad that Carpenter had the instincts to avoid that situation. Yeah. I just wish that they had thought about that in this comic because, I mean, I think the idea of having a love story between two things and exploring the mentality of what it's like to have these unique organisms that are both kind of the same but kind of different and then what happens when – I don't know. It just I, – it, I mean, you could even go to the old trope of she thinks that this is a great love and a great romance and finds out that he's the one who's the slut who's spreading it around, you know? Yeah. As the sailor in the port town where you fall in love with the sailor and find out that he's got someone in another port. Right. I mean, there's potential there. There's a lot of good ideas. It's just so much of it is not well realized. No. And it's a shame because I, I originally I was kind of put off. Then I was kind of getting into it. And then I got put off again as it kind of went along. I'm curious to actually check out more work by some of these creators. Like, I want to see some of the stuff that this writer has done. Mm -hmm. Because I enjoy that he is thinking differently and thinking outside the box instead of just doing another retelling of the original thing, which is three out of the four comics that we've talked about now basically are. Yeah. You know, and this is something different. It doesn't work, but it's different. It shows, again, that there's potential to do something different. Right. If you really want to sit down and think it through. But yeah, it just, it doesn't follow through. And again, even when she's attacking people, we're not even getting, like, full things. It's just, like, some tentacle shootout. Right. I mean, there's a couple of full things when he bursts into a full transformation that are pretty well drawn, like in the prison when they set Powell on fire or near the end. But for the most part, it's not even a thing. It's it's just like it's a vampire that just has like a spiny tentacle that it shoots out. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of the problem I have is just that it, the good ideas are interesting. They just don't quite fit. And then the rest of it is this kind of blah. Yeah. Like I said, the McCready part could be cut entirely. And I think if you had cut the McCready part, even aside from strengthening the storytelling, 
I think it would have made this easier to accept just as kind of its own little thing. Right. As opposed to following the continuing adventures of McCready and the Thing. Mm-hmm. You know, which a lot of the alien stories, the alien comics had their ongoing stuff and then they had their, here's just a bizarre Gonzo side story that has nothing to do with anything. And like touching it back on the McCready thing, there's like, there's a point where he says, oh, they can copy their victims and so that way that's not the real Jenny that's on there. That's one of your crewmen who's died when he mm-hmm. finds her body on the ship. Well, how does he know that? Because we've never seen that before other than in this comic series. Because the writer told him. Right, exactly. And it just doesn't feel like it should have had McCready in it. And I would have been like, oh, that's a neat power that we never got to see in the film. But because they make such a big deal about it in this comic and McCready knows about it, even though it's not been shown in not only the movie, but none of the previous comics where we've seen McCready in, it just feels like a, a strange choice. Yeah. That's kind of the whole problem with it. It's like some really interesting choices, but a lot of them are strange and don't quite work. And none of them they thought through. Right. So anything else you want to say about the thing Eternal Vows? Yeah, there's something there. So I can see why people might want to check it out. Just keep your expectations managed. If you're a fan of the thing who's tired of the fact that thing stories keep doing the same thing... It might be worth a look just because it does something different. Right. But if you're a fan of the thing for all the reasons that the thing is the thing, I think you'll just be left confused. <laughs> yeah. Confused and a little disappointed. Yeah. I think we have said about it as much as I can. I really am so like on that edge of if it had just been a little bit better, it would make it a clear recommend just because I love some of the ideas. It just needs more fleshing out and needed to fit in this universe better. Yeah. And it just doesn't quite do that yet. I would be interested to see if this writer, if he had ever followed it up. I'm curious to see the movie that he wrote and directed. Interesting. Because he has that full-length feature film that he just came out with in 2010. I'm curious to just see what it's like. I'd be curious. Not that this was a great story, but I could see he has potential as far as a writer. And I could see maybe with 20 years of experience on top of that, you know, maybe he's gotten a bit better. And what's funny is I knew from the beginning that this book was going to be set in New Zealand. And as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, you know, this writer, they basically just wrote a token small fishing town and just occasionally threw the word Struth in or the word bloody. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, there's nothing about it that makes it particularly New Zealandish. Which is why I was surprised to find it was written by a New Zealander. Well, it kind of makes sense because it's usually the Americans that are trying to, like, play up the accent so much. Yeah, that's true. That he just kind of knew how to just toss in a little bit now and then. I also like that it's here and not like Maine because it's still keeping things isolated. Mm -hmm. So we should point out that it would be another 16 years before there was another Thing comic. So Eternal Vows was kind of the end of that chain of the adventures of McCready. Yeah. So between these four comics, would you have liked to have seen them continue? Or do you kind of just like, yeah, it kind of ran its course. (sighs) See, and if we had stopped with the questionable research, I would have said, I really don't need another telling of the movie again. Eternal Vows had at least something new. And even though I don't necessarily agree with the direction it went... I could see somebody else possibly coming in and maybe using that as a springboard to something new and different that would have actually fit in with the rules established of the film, but still find its own way of delivering horror that's not just the thing on a boat or the thing in a plane or the thing in a shopping mall or whatever the heck the next sequel would have probably would have been if they had continued. The thing in a car, the thing in a bar, the thing has gone far. (laughs) Uh, But uh, yeah, consider. Considering it didn't, I'm not really disappointed. I don't really regret that yet. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I do like that McCready has gotten to a point where the movie, the first miniseries, and the second miniseries are kind of this whole chain of how he just kind of keeps running and the thing keeps stumbling after him. But with this story, I kind of like that, no, McCready has finally stopped running. He's kind of settled down. Now he's at a point where he is back at home. He's starting to research, keep an eye on the news, and actively go to situations where he feels the thing might be surfacing again. I kind of like that idea of McCready and maybe those other two survivors from Climate of Fear are like, we're going to become the new strike team that's going to keep our eye out for more things. I like the idea of him being proactive. The problem is I didn't really like the idea of him becoming an action hero. Yeah. And again, the way that they played up his shiny new flamethrower was just so ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's not Rambo with a new gun. Come on. (laughs) 
And then, of course, that he loses it within an issue. Well, he only really had, like, two issues to do anything. Yeah. So, like I said, he should not have been in that comic. Yeah, McCready should not become G.I. Joe. Right. With the thing as his Cobra that he's always running off the fight. But our new story, we don't get any McCready. No. In fact, we get a whole different type of character that I was not really expecting when you add this one onto the list. I was like, I don't know what Northman Nightmare, what is this? We should point out that it's been 16 years where there haven't been anything comics made. There was this brief resurgence of the things in the 2000s. We had the video game come out. There was this attempt to make a miniseries called Return of the Thing, which I've covered in another episode. And then in 2011, they finally came out with the Thing prequel movie. Now, you still haven't seen the Thing prequel movie, correct? Correct. I was not going to do this comic for this podcast because it's a prequel to the prequel movie. But having read the comic, it kind of has jack all to do with the prequel movie and it's just another generic thing story. So I figure, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and throw it in. And it is indeed a generic thing story. Well, we'll get, we'll get into we'll it. We'll get there, yeah. Yeah, so The Thing, Northman Nightmare, and for some reason they're just able to call it The Thing now instead of Thing from Another World. I guess Marvel's not trying to sue him anymore. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of surprised when I saw that. Um, now, this was a digital comic, correct? It was. It was a digital original comic. So I wonder if that maybe... I would think that the trademark would still stand, but I don't know. There's probably two factors to it. One, I don't know that Marvel ever threatened to sue. I think they were just worried that Marvel would back in the 90s. And I think also there hasn't been a thing ongoing comic series since, I want to say, the late 80s, early 90s. Mm, yeah, there was. Dan Slott did one like in the early 2000s. Oh, well, still, that was like 10 years before this. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. I think they had enough protection and justification, especially by tying into a new movie, that they could get around it. Right. I don't think anyone was going to look at this and think of Aunt Petunia's blue-eyed thing, you know? Right. And plus, like I said, it's because it's a digital comic, and I think it was for free on the Dark Horse store. So it's not like you're expecting to see a Marvel comic in Dark Horse's own digital comic store. But yeah, it was a digital comic. And again, the last thing that they've ever done, thing related to Dark Horse, maybe they'll do some more later. I'm kind of surprised that everything just died with the prequel movie. Uh, well, not entirely surprised. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, maybe not entirely. But you'd think that Dark Horse would have run with it, because I know they've been doing a big push again with Aliens and Predator and Prometheus recently. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it's weird that they chose to do the story as they did. Yeah. It is just basically a one-off story that they just kind of broke into chapters. Right. In fact, actually, I'm kind of surprised that they still did this because did they still have the license or did they have to re-up that, yeah. renegotiate it just to do this one, like, 20-odd page story? And then I'm surprised that if they re-engage the license, why haven't they made the older thing comics available? Yeah. It's possible that the filmmakers just negotiated a deal for just this one story. I mean, and maybe it was just that simple. They wanted to have something that would tie in, and since they had a history with Dark Horse, they yeah. went with them. It was released in September of 2011 and was written by Steve Niles with art by Patrick Reynolds and colors by Dave Stewart. Now, do any of these names ring a bell? Uh, yes. Yeah. Steve Niles is probably best known for 30 Days of Night. 30 Days of Night, which he also co-wrote the movie version for. Right. And Dave Stewart is very famous. As a colorist. He does all of Tim Sale's stuff, yeah. Right. I am not familiar with the artist. Yeah, Patrick Reynolds, all I can really find on him is he's just been a regular at Dark Horse for the last decade and has worked on like Abe Sapien, BPRD, Aliens, Falling Skies, King Conan, Prometheus, and Serenity. So basically just a Dark Horse house artist. Hmm. But Steve Niles, yeah, one of his big early things is that he used to work at a comic book store called the College of Comic Book Knowledge, which then broke off into two stores, the Comic Book College and the Nostalgia Zone. And I know this because my dad was the manager who broke off the Nostalgia Zone. So I have had it officially confirmed from Steve Niles himself that he remembers me as the kid sitting in the comic store every weekend eating cheese. <laughs> Seriously, I went up to him at a convention a few years ago and say, hey, do you remember me? I'm the son of Joel Thingval. And he goes, weren't you the kid who always ate cheese? And I said, yes, I am now lactose intolerant. He says, I'm not surprised. <laughs> So, yeah. That's that's cool that he remembers you, though. That's my connection to Steve Niles. 
So back in the 80s, he started up his own indie label, Arcane Comics, where he published the anthology Tapping the Vein and created a number of works for Eclipse Comics, often adapting the writings of Richard Matheson and Clive Barker, with whom he also collaborated on a number of original stories. And he just kept working through the horror market, doing anthology stories, adaptations. He did like I Am Legend, the old movie M, did a whole bunch of stuff, but he never really took off until he became a regular writer on Spawn for, I want to say, a couple of years, and then launched his own creator-owned book, 30 Days of Night, which then, of course, took off into a big franchise, sold movie rights, made him a big name. And he has been an incredibly prolific go-to guy for horror stories, tons and tons and tons of original miniseries and one-shots. A lot of times whenever someone is starting up an original comic book company, they'll go to him and say, hey, you got three issues of something you can sell us. And among that, he's had brief runs on like Batman and the Creeper and very much the go-to horror guy in comics these days. Yep. Despite my connection with it, I've read very little of his work. I've only read a few stories here and there. I've never read 30 Days of Night. I actually have not either, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it's a famous comic and it's one of the things that's hard. If you're familiar with any horror comics at all, it's one of the ones that you'll hear about all the time. I think it was, it took me a while to get into Ben Temple Smith as an artist, so I just wasn't into him yet at the time. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Ben Temple Smith style either. He's hit or miss. Mostly I've read his early stuff they did with like Clive Barker. Like he adapted a lot of the books of the blood. Him and Barker did an original Night of the Living Dead sequel of what all happened in London when that day went down. Hmm. Some really neat stuff in there. So what is the story of North Man Nightmare? It's the thing with Vikings. <laughs> you know how we were just saying like how they keep retelling the story over and over again? They told the story over and over again, this time with Vikings. The, what's weird is that even though everything is set in Antarctica, somehow yet another saucer also containing the thing ended up in Greenland in around 1000 AD. And so yeah, a group of Vikings come across a town where everyone's been killed except for these five women. And oh no, the women are things. Yeah. Yeah, and then they kill everybody except for two of them, and then they're like, well, we're stuck here because their ship was frozen in ice and there's no way to get home. They directly straight up reveal that one of them is a thing, but he just regrows his severed hand in front of the other person. Which is really a stupid way of keeping secret, but I guess you have to have something to show the audience, though it could have done something where the camera shows us the hand, and except the guy doesn't yeah. see it or something. I do like the final shot, though, where you know they have this conversation conversation about everything that's gone on and how they're stuck. And the one guy just grows his hand, leans on it, smiles and says, I wonder what they'll find when they get here. Right. And it's like, that, that's fine. But it's like, again, I don't know who these characters are. It's a very short comic. It's it's 24 pages, I think. Yeah. And even that was broken into parts. Yeah. And it was clearly just there to be a very short story using the thing concept and really didn't have any time to develop it any further just because, yeah, it's the thing with Vikings. It's a neat idea, but there's not enough time to really develop it any further because there's just 20-odd pages, which admittedly, that's the average length of a comic pretty much nowadays. For a one-shot, nothing really happens. Yeah, yeah. I think having the ambition to tell a story set in Viking days also means that they had to kind of not set that up. Like, they didn't say, like, here are the Vikings. They existed in Scandinavia during this period of time or anything like that. But they had to show, like, okay, why are they here in this remote area? It's, you know, a remote village. By the time they actually get to the things, it's like halfway through the comic. You know, at least where they're actively showing themselves as things, even though it's kind of obvious when you see five girls that are just standing there saying, oh, we survived, everybody else is dead, but we're here. And the one guy bursts out and says, they did it. But then they throw him on a fire and he turns into a thing. Is that him or is that somebody else? No, that was him. Yeah. The art is that kind of bland photoreal style where it's kind of hard to tell people apart. Yeah. I had trouble following that part, to be honest. When I first heard about this, I was like, okay, so are they basically just going to like redo Beowulf where Grendel is the thing? And I'm like, there's potential there. They actually did that with an alien comic where they retold the story of Beowulf where Grendel was a xenomorph. Hmm. But it's like, okay, I understand where they're coming from here is one of the big things about the thing is the Norwegians. So how can we have old medieval Norwegians encounter the thing? Well, instead of actually having them go to Antarctica, heaven forbid... Let's just have a completely separate ship that we've never heard of before that has nothing to do with anything. Landed in Greenland. Yeah. 
I don't remember what they say in the film, but it was supposed to be like tens of thousands or a hundred thousand years. It was a hundred thousand years ago, yeah. Yeah, that the original ship landed. So the fact that another one, now maybe we don't know where these ones, how long they've been here. Maybe they came after the original one looking for that and they also crash landed and got frozen and got thawed out around this time period. But it's a weird choice to have that because this is not something that, as far as we know, there's been lots of visitors. You have to do one hell of a wiggle to get a thing up there at this point of time. Yeah. Without just completely redoing the story. Right. And it feels weird to have this be the prequel story to the prequel story. Which, again, because the prequel follows the Norwegian camp, is it, well, let's just do ancient Norwegians. Right. And I could kind of understand that instinct to want to cover, like, we have Norwegians in the film, we're going to have Norwegians in the story. But, again, it doesn't fit this universe that we've established. And it feels kind of like, it's again, it's just the thing with Vikings. And that could have been cool. I think if you had, like, a four-issue miniseries where you're allowed to really kind of build up the characters and, like, maybe it could have been an interesting spin on it as opposed to just telling McCready gets on another situation where he has to fight the thing. But, unfortunately, just the short nature of the story... And I imagine that most comic writers today are not really used to writing one shots. And I think that kind of shows with this. I think you could have told an interesting story with this situation that may have been a retread, but at least it would have been a somewhat novel retread. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing here. It's the thing with Vikings. And that's all I keep saying, because that's all this is. Okay, so basically, I haven't been able to resist on the last few episodes saying what my own rewrite of the story would be. (laughs) Okay, if we're going to do this, let's do a play on the witch trials. Let's do a play on a community where this thing is starting to spread. They start blaming and singling out a bunch of young women. And of course, it all leads to the only way you can know for sure is to burn it on a stake. If you burn human, then that means you die human and your soul goes to heaven. If you burned into a thing, that means you were evil. Mm -hmm. I could see taking elements of this community where it's five women, one of them's a thing, all of them are a thing, who knows, and tying it to those tropes of the witch trials and getting an interesting story out of it. You don't even need to explain where the thing came from another ship. Just have it be like it floated in on an iceberg, you know? A chunk of ice floated up and landed on the island. You could just have it be that, oh, that was just a piece that came off of Antarctica, you know? Mm -hmm. There are things that you could do there. It didn't feel like anyone had any ideas or passion for the story. They were just kind of like, Norway, Vikings, thing. And that's all the story is. Yeah, pretty much. I kind of get the impression that this feels like a cash-in. Like, as much as I really have not loved any of these comics that we have discussed... This one feels like the cheapest. This one definitely feels, out of all of them, like this was the one where somebody had wrote a check and said, make a thing comic, and cartoon dollar signs appeared in the Dark Horse exec's eyes. And so this is about as much thought as they put into it. Like, okay, we'll ship something out real quick, and so that way we can tie it in with the movie. No, and I agree. And I think the earlier ones were more just, hey, we got the light license for this thing it came out 10 years ago but we just got the license we're doing a lot of tie-ins why don't around the room of who all here is at dark horse just all of you think up some ideas and pitch them and then they have the pitch meeting and we'll go like okay we'll start with your idea and then we'll do your idea and then we'll do your idea whereas this one is just like we have a film we need something in a couple of months yeah It feels rushed, and this probably should not be the way you judge any of the creators involved, because I have a feeling this was probably, like I said, very rushed. But I absolutely cannot recommend this. It's just, there's nothing there. I mean, at least Eternal Vows, as much as it frustrated us, at least it generated an interesting conversation. This is just 20-odd pages of padding with absolutely nothing in there other than the kind of classic thing story that we've seen now like four or five times, if not more, when you count things like Return of the Thing or whatever, but with nothing interesting about it other than the fact that it's got Vikings in it. One thing that I do kind of like is the flippancy of just how violent of barbarians they are. Like, oh, that guy's running away. Let me throw an axe in his back. We'll toss him on the fire, you know? Oh, you got frostbite on your hand while trying to save someone. Let me just whack that hand off there for you. Yeah. There you go. You're safe now, buddy. (laughs) You know, and then I like that you have a guy who loses his hand and then that ties to the ending. But again, I wish that guy had been built as a character. It feels like something that was just spat out fast. Mm -hmm. I love the thing. I love John Carpenter's The Thing. I love the novella. I love the 1951 The Thing. I love having all three of those. As a franchise, I would love to see more Thing. 
but they've just never given me anything that's yeah. really that good. I mean, like even last episode, I still had certain things that I liked about those two miniseries, especially the second one, but they still weren't that good. And honestly, the only thing that I've liked post John Garber's The Thing is that Return of the Thing miniseries, which they never ended up making. <laughs> right. Because the prequel movie I'm okay with, but it's not good. And it's just, it's bland. And it's just the exact same story. It does exactly the same thing those first few miniseries do. It just retell the same story. Mm-hmm. Eternal Vows was an interesting departure, but it wasn't a very good one. So if somebody came up to you and said, would you be interested in another Thing comic, what would you say? Yeah. You So you're still interested. You still want that. Good. I feel the same way because that film is so good. And I listened to your Return of the Thing episode. There is potential in expanding that universe. Yeah. Did you read the massive article that went along with it? Not yet. I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> I'm genuinely interested in seeing more. It's just that they don't have anything interesting to say about it. And the one person who tried to do something new and different with it didn't do a great job with it. But that was the one I think I liked the best out of all of them, even though it's not very good. It tried to do something new and original with this. And the rest of it is just basically we got more or less the exact same story again and again and again. And that's the thing is my favorite is still Climate of Fear, if we're just going by the comics, because while it is a derivative story, I actually thought that it took the time to build characters. I thought the actual execution of the thing transformation sequence was very innovative and clever and it found new and different things to do with each one some that harken back to the original story i thought that it actually had some genuine scares and tension and suspense and i actually just like the art and the writing in it i think it was the best executed out of all of them but again at its core it is the exact same story yeah and i think that's what frustrates me the most is i just i've had that story i appreciate that story I don't need it served to me again and again each time, usually with diminishing returns. My thing is, I don't mind if something uses tropes and cliches and is derivative, as long as it does it well. And even Climate of Fear had characters, like there was that crazed guy who cut his own arm off and ended up saving everyone in the end. Yeah. Even some of its whole scenes of everyone sitting around getting tested and like one guy just suddenly melts into a puddle and tries to scurry away. There were scenes in that that I really enjoyed and really stuck with me. I understand what you're saying. I do think as far as like telling a story with compelling characters, that was the one that did it best. But Eternal Vows, I grant you, is the boldest in terms of trying to do something new. Exactly. And that's the reason why I lean towards that one. But yeah, none of these were great, unfortunately. And that's a shame because I really do think there is potential. But in order to do that, you're going to have to A, have something to say. B, you're going to have to put John Carpenter on the shelf. And I say that with all due respect. But you can't keep going back to that same story. Well, and that's why I would love to see more stories. And, you know, we get echoes of that briefly in Climate of Fear and Questionable Research that echo back to the novella. Or stories that echo back to the 1951 film. Grand, there might be copyright reasons why they can't, because that was a Warner Brothers movie, not Universal. But something that echoes back to what came before Carpenter and trying to mix it with Carpenter. Try to find something that's kind of like an overall, like, it ties into all the versions of things, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would love to see that. And, you know, what was great about Return of the Thing was it was one of the few that said, okay, the thing makes it to mainland. Let's see what happens. And none of the other tie-ins have been bold enough to do that. Even in Eternal Vow, it's still an isolated island on an isolated continent. Well, and like in Climate of Fear, they do go to the mainland and it, nothing really seems to happen. That was the biggest flaw of Climate of Fear is there is no reason why things shouldn't have swept over the earth when you put it near a rainforest. Right, exactly. You put it near a rainforest, it's going to spread in there like wildfire. Yeah, the first bird that infects basically dooms the rest of the humanity. Mosquitoes, gnats, fish, yeah. it's going to get everywhere. <laughs> That again ties into a conversation we had about Alien and Predator is I don't mind flooding the market with shit as long as there's still good stuff within it. The more things, stories you tell, the better your chances are going to be of actually coming across a good one. Right. Because, I mean, we've had five comics, three movies, one novella, one short story, and an unproduced miniseries in a video game. So that's a nice little handful of stories. The percentage of those that are worth watching is about the percentage that they should be. Like 20%. (laughs) Yeah, that makes sense. And I do hope that something, whether it's a comic or it's another video game or miniseries or sequel film or remake or whatever, they do come back to this universe. 
but I've been frustrated by more of what I've seen than what anything has gotten me excited. But I still hold on to that hope because yeah. I really do think that John Carpenter film is so good. And just everything we've gotten so far was just leftovers. It's like somebody put it in the microwave for 30 seconds and had a dash of Viking or a yeah. dash of a uh, research ship or whatever. Again, yeah, thing leaves me wanting more. And that's why I want more people to make more thing stories. I know more of them are going to be like what we have here. Most of the Alien comics that we had are just derivative retreads of Alien, but there are still some really damn good ones. It was because of that that we got the Mike Mignola, P. Craig Russell one of a priest stranded on a planet alone with an alien, struggling with his existential faith. You know, that was an amazing comic. And we got that because they were making enough money out of all the crappy derivative ones that they could take a bold risk. Mm -hmm. I think it was just the thing probably just didn't sell. No one was buying these, so they just stopped making them. Well, the thing has never been a commercial hit. As much as it's a fan hit, it's never resonated quite as much as it probably deserves to, because it is a really awesome horror film. So I can kind of see, like, especially when you start calling it a thing from another world, some people may not even realize it's connected to that universe. The grand majority of people who have seen the John Carpenter one have never even heard of the 1951 version. Right. And so I could see, like, that might throw some people off. And like you said, I think it's a little bit of a shame that it didn't do better, just because I think if it had continued on. And, like, some of the stories, like, at least where they ended, I was kind of curious to see where they would go. Yeah. But each miniseries kind of ignored the other one, other than... The most loosest connections. The tie of Mac, yeah. Yeah. And even then, like in Eternal Vows, there's nothing Mac says or does that really ties into what happened in Climate of Fear where we last saw him. That's kind of what you get when there isn't a creative force spearheading things. Right. you think there'd be some editor or somebody who could say, this is what this guy's doing. Do you think you could tie that in a little bit stronger when you introduce Mac in this story or whatever? And I don't think that's something that really started happening at Dark Horse until Star Wars hit a certain point. Because even, you know, the early Star Wars comics, you know, not talking about the Marvel stuff, but when they started at Dark Horse in the 90s, the early ones were these kind of odd, one-off miniseries. Some of them were really good. Some... It was a lot of anthology stuff, wasn't it? Yeah, the Star Wars tales. And they just kind of did like these various miniseries until, I think, from like 95, 96, they started building, okay, this is the whole line of Knights of the Old Republic. This is the whole line of pre-A New Hope. This is the whole line of post-A New Hope, you know? And they started to actually pull together and get more supervision in terms of making sure everything's strung together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Alien line started off that way, where it was the story of Ripley and Newt coming back, and then Alien 3 came out. <laughs> and they couldn't keep using Ripley and Newt because they're technically dead. Yeah. <laughs> So then it just became a whole series of one-offs and miniseries. None of them really string together in a chronology. None of them really string together in a story. They're just a whole bunch of everyone just kind of taking their own shot at Alien. Right. But again, you know, I don't mind that because you're going to have a handful of people who still tell really interesting Alien stories. But again, it's not like Transformers. You can sit down and here's a starting point and you keep reading. Is there really like the adventures of Mac? You're not really going to get much if you start with Thing from Another World and just keep reading through Eternal Vows. No. I think we may have set our piece here on, on the thing, uh, yeah. which is a shame because I do hope that there might be something in the future with this property. We've had a resurgence of Carpenter Comics with Big Trouble in Little China and Escape from New York, so maybe. Maybe after the stink of the prequel kind of fades a little bit more, maybe somebody will come back to this. But I want one more thing story where everyone gathers around in a circle around something in the ice. Because that is the one image that is the key image of the thing franchise that nobody else really uses anymore. Even the prequel movie dropped the ball on that. Hopefully, one day, maybe you and I will reunite if they do. I'm up for it. We still have quite a bit of long box carpentry to go. That's right. What are we doing next? Next, we look at The Adventures of Snake Plissken, published by Marvel, and The Snake Plissken Chronicles, published by CrossGen. Ooh, CrossGen. And that is another one of those comics that I've actually read in the past, so it'll be interesting to revisit. That is intriguing. I've never actually read a CrossGen comic, but it's one of those companies I always really was interested by, so I'm looking forward to this. CrossGen comics are some of the best comics that did not deserve the fate that they got. Oh, yeah. Anyways, I think that wraps up this episode of Longbox Carpentry. Thank you again for joining me, JD. Absolutely my pleasure. And we'll see you back in the... I don't have a funny tagline. And we'll see you later. <laughs> I was going to say, in the in the long pages. <laughs> or the funny box, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see you in the... I don't know. 
Yeah. Good night, everybody. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. As we stick another nail in the long box. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> You're digging our own long box as we speak. Yeah.